because it's not built on the rock. And what is the rock? The rock is what the Lord had to say. So here's why we got to respond. He's going to do his part. But now the question is, are you and I going to do our part? The Bible says that the people from morning to, that's a long time, from morning, we can barely last 30 minutes sometimes, but from morning to midday because they understood when we forsook the law, it didn't go well, so we're going to pay attention no matter how long it takes. So right now the question is, are we ready to give attention? Are we ready to focus? I said this scripture earlier this morning. The proverb says that a person who has no control over their spirit is like a city that's broken down and has no walls. That means that anything go. Any thought that come, I'm going to do that now. And so that's what the enemy wants because he wants you to be distracted. So your soil, you might hear it, but you're not really listening. You're not paying attention. You don't hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. So it's easy for him, as soon as he say amen, for him to snatch it away from you. So this morning, let's be dedicated. Let's be committed. I am going to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to me through the bishop this morning. Amen. Are we in that place? So come on, join me in prayer. Just join me in prayer quickly. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word that you gave to us that is life, that we live by, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. We remember again what Jesus said. Our stability. What is your response to what God has done? And now here is Bishop Cornell King with today's teaching. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. We speak over each and every one of your lives. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Even those of you that have connected on our social media platform, we'd like to welcome you as well. While you are standing in the sanctuary, won't you just lift those hands in the air for just a moment? And we just want to say, Lord, I need you. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't say it because I asked you to say it. Say it because that's our truth. That's our reality this morning. Lord, we need you, God. Hallelujah. We need you, God. We need you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For bless the Lord, 
O my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. God, we need you, God. We need you. There's some in need of healing, some in need of, of, of provisions, God, some in need of just being put back together again, oh God. Whatever the need is, God, we know you are a need meter and we surrender our ways, we surrender our will in this very moment and we ask for a spirit of oneness in this place like never before so that the Shekinah glory of God can fall upon his people and meet their every need right where they are in the name of Jesus. And we declare, declare even now, God, that you are doing a great thing right now in the hearts of your people, oh God from the front to the back, from the back to the front, oh God. We do nothing, oh God. We decrease that you may increase in us, oh God. And so we give you honor. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. To God be the glory. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is always good to congregate together with God's people, and it's even a good thing that we can acknowledge one another in our respective places. I'd like to take the, our, the opportunity to acknowledge the First Lady of the Life Center Church Incorporated, First Lady Guandria Kimball. We thank you for your presence with us. Amen. And to her left, we always want to acknowledge my wife, my queen for life, Lady Veronica King, uh, in her presence. <clears throat> Thank God for all the leaders in your respective places this morning. Thank God for each of you and for every household that is represented in this place this morning. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I want us to do our communion first this morning because there's a word that's in the atmosphere that cannot be overlooked and that word is covenant, it's covenant. And in our teaching this morning, we're going to share with you how God does not look at individuals. He look at those who are in covenant relationship with him. In Israel's case, it was the whole nation. In our case, it's the whole body of Christ. So one doing well does not give that one any room to rejoice when there's others that are not doing well. The Bible says one suffer, all suffer. And we have to get beyond the self selfishness and embrace the selflessness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. <clears throat> in our communion this morning, I want to take it word for word as it is, as it is recorded in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking. And he writes, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat all of you. In the same manner, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup, this cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink all of you. He concludes this section, verse 26, by saying, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the church said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> For the last few weeks, I didn't plan for it to happen this way, but it did. Thank you, Lord. I started speaking to you from the subject matter of have faith in God, have faith in God. And that was taken out of the book of Galatians chapter one. We then came back and we shared with you, hear God, amen. 
hear God. And that was taken out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Well, this morning, we're on the God series, <clears throat> and it is obey God. That's the topic for this morning. Obey God. Obey God. It's to our advantage not to try to obey God the way we obey our parents as children. Because for many of us, everything our parents told us not to do, we couldn't wait to do. To obey God means I submit and comply with the authority of his word for my life. To obey God means I submit and comply with the authority of his word for my life. This morning, I want us to take a look in the book of Joshua. And keep in mind, as we teach on this this morning, the word covenant. Because sometimes we can get beside ourselves and we think, well, it's just me. No, when it comes to our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, it's bigger than us. What we do, what we don't do, what we say, what we don't say is bigger than us. It affects all of us. And I pray that God, through his Holy Spirit, will begin to release that understanding in the hearts of his people that I do have an effect on what I, what I do does have an effect on your lives. What you do has an effect on my life. And the church said, amen. amen. <laughs> this thing... This Christendom is bigger than us as individuals. Yet, the Word of God says there are many members but one body. We all make up the body of Christ. One suffer, all suffers. I cannot be so excited about prospering and living on top of the world, as they say, and knowing that my neighbor, my fellow brother and sister in Christ, are barely making ends meet. God did not call us to have a selfish spirit, but a selfless one. And he, did, he demonstrated his love for us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die for each and every one of us. And if you don't know what to do, just follow the example that's already been laid out. And it doesn't mean we're going to get it right every time, but at least we have a goal in which we are moving towards. In the book of Joshua, chapter 7, the Word of God says, but the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully. Okay. Bishop, why you want to start us in the middle of a sentence like that? But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully. So let's paint the backdrop or let's get the picture of what Israel did for verse 7, verse 1 in chapter 7 to read as it does. In chapter 6 of Joshua, beginning at verse 2, the Bible says this, The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho into your hands with its kings and the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark, then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people, somebody shout, all the people, shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall, flat, will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. As I read that, it, it occurred to me that 
today's generation would not probably have been able to allow the walls of Jericho to come down. Not that God didn't have his part down. He got his part. But it was something about when you use that word all in today's generation and in the church today. God told Joshua, he says, after you march around, he says, all the people shall shout. When I read that, I just thought of certain individuals that would, make the, that would respond, well, I don't feel like shouting today. Why do, why do I need to shout? With all these people in here, why do I need to say anything? That's how our human nature talks to us. That's part of the deception. It starts very subtly. This don't make no sense to me anyway. Why we got to shout? I don't feel like shouting. I'm doing my best to restrain from all the neck movement. <laughs> Joshua led Israel into 31 conquests over a period of seven years. In that seven-year period, their record was 30 and 1. 30 victories, one defeat. And that one defeat is what caused them to rethink and assess their relationship with God. I remember growing up and we used to watch this show on ABC. Didn't mean to give that plug, but anyway. It was called Wide World of Sports. And it would start with this claim, with the saying, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. <laughs> the problem with that is too many of God's people are experiencing the agony of defeat more so than the thrill of victory. And you have to ask yourself at some point, you need to take a step back and say, God, if everything of your word is true, why is it that my life is producing what it's producing? God told them, say, when you war around the seven towns, everybody shout. So when we say we want everybody to come to prayer meeting, Y'all ready to move on? <laughs> okay. Verse 2, the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given you Jericho. You shall march around the city. Verse 3, the men circling the city once. At that time, my brothers and sisters, Jericho only covered about seven to eight acres. It took them approximately about 30 minutes to make one encircle around Jericho. And they did this for seven days. And they, for the first six days when they, did, when they did that, you can imagine the people in Jericho who are people of war, they was like, what is wrong with them? They must be out of their mind. So on the seventh day, Let's start at verse 12. Let's pick up at verse 12. Chapter 6, verse 12. Now Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the, the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while they continued to blow the trumpets. The second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. Now, I would assure you that in order to build their confidence and their trust in God, which was what this whole exercise was lending itself to, they were being told on a daily basis, this is what you are to do. Joshua did not say it one time and then they went about it for the rest of the week. Amen? So... Verse 15 says, then on the seventh day, 
They rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. How many of us know that God really don't need to go through some deep, mystical presentation to bless your life? God has already said what he would do for each and every one of us. We just have to release the faith to believe that what God said is true and that it will come to pass in our lives. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Verse 17 The city shall fall, the city shall be under the ban. The city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Mark that. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Now, the ban, the ban is something that is prohibited. It's off limits. For us today, the ban would be all the thou shall nots in the scripture, specifically the commandments in Exodus 20. The ban here in verse 18 the word of God says, but as for you only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel a curse and bring trouble on it. Because they were in a covenant relationship with God, if one person violated the ban, it affected the whole nation. Verse 19, but all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Give me a few minutes, then we're going to just go through here. The people shouted. The walls came down. Verse 22. Joshua said to two men who had spied out the land, go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had. They also brought out all her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. The reason they placed them outside of the camp of Israel is because they had to be cleansed. They had to be purified, consecrated to come in amongst the nation of Israel. Okay. Verse 24. They burned the city with fire and all that was in it. Only the silver and gold, the articles of bronze and iron, bronze and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. However, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. For she hid the messengers for whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. The point is this. Don't write people off today because you don't know what God has planned for their tomorrow. Rahab, as, more, as much as she probably was looked down upon for being a harlot, is a part of the messianic lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that son and that daughter, because they're not doing what we think they ought to be doing today, don't write them off. 
You don't know how God wants to use their experiences in their tomorrow. The same way we didn't know how God was going to work through our foolishness, our unrighteousness, our disbelief, our unfaithfulness, and the list goes on and on and on to the break of... But yeah, my point is this, you never know what God wants to do in a person's life. My God. Somebody shout covenant. I don't know who that little guy was, but God bless him. Okay. Let's go down to verse 1 of chapter 7. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban, the things that we just mentioned in verse 18 and 19 of chapter 6. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. He wasn't just upset with Achan alone. It was the whole nation of Israel. For us to, to declare and to have as a vision to be a strong relational church, that means I have to be just as much concerned about the things that you're doing, Elder Young, as much as myself. I cannot find gratitude in thinking that I'm walking before the Lord and the Lord is blessing me right now, right now, oh Lord, right now. That does nobody no good. Nobody in this church benefits from that position but me, which is a very selfish position. So they have victory at Jericho, but God was upset with them because one person violated the ban. Verse 2, now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Haven, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. Do not make all the people Toil up there, for they are few. Two th observations I made in that one verse alone. First of all, they were overconfident. The most dangerous place for a child of God to be is that place right after God has brought you victory in your life. We are the most vulnerable right after God has blessed us. We are the most vulnerable right after God has honored our breakthrough. Because now... We on our own now. Because of the victory at Jericho, the spies went up overconfident and told them, oh, it's only about two or 3,000. You don't need to take everybody up there. Don't trouble the people. The second thing is there's no mention of prayer. No mention of prayer or evidence of dependence on God. That victory they just had in Jericho, they thought they made that happen. The victory was all because of God. All God wanted from them, as he do from us today, is obedience. Many of us fail today because we don't realize our enemy is powerful. If you can look and see anybody in here, that's not your enemy. Okay. 
Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against people. This word struggle, Paul equates it to that of uh, someone grappling, a wrestler, which means you're talking about close proximity. You're talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's saying this ain't your struggle. This ain't the battle you in. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against. And he's going to list four things. Four things that our battle consists of. It's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Not just rulers, but the rulers. That definite article, T-H-E, the, eliminates a whole lot of fluff. Against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness. So if all you got to wrestle or to battle with is your intellect, you already defeated. But there's hope. <sighs> okay, I love this, I love this. In Ephesians chapter 1, before we got over to chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says something very profound. Okay, the beginning of that sentence starts at verse 13. Well, verse 18. He says this, first in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of your calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power, of his power, of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. That's why we get over back over to chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can't beat none of these four people we just listed on your own power. Because we are mere flesh and blood. He goes on to say in verse 20 of chapter 1, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Hallelujah. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. That's why the enemy want to keep us looking cockeyed at each other. I'm not big on cartoons, but I remember when Joshua was growing up, he had this one cartoon called Power Rangers. Since he's not here to defend himself, I'm going to blame it on him. And they would come together, these Power Rangers, 
I'm getting that mixed up with He-Man. He-Man, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The point is, when they came together, they were able to do more greater things together than they could as individuals by themselves. It's no different from us, people of God. Yes, you have a great prayer life. Yes, you have a good time of Bible study. But when two are put together, one can chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand. So why do we want to stay separated when we can come together and do great exploits for the kingdom of God. Glory to God. That's why the enemy will have you to believe. Don't worry about trying to connect with them. They're all right. They, they don't do like you do. Don't, don't, don't. When you get done with church, just go out the quickest door. Don't speak to nobody. Don't ask nobody their name. That way you won't have to worry about building a relationship with them. And the church said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, let's go back over to Joshua. So they made a mistake of being overconfident. They also made a mistake of not praying. The word of God says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication, make your requests made known unto God. They told him, say, oh, don't, don't let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to AI. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. Now, if you read ahead, just flip over one page and look at verse 25 of chapter 8. Verse 25 says, All who fell that day, talking about Ai, both men and women, were 12,000. All the people of Ai, 12,000. And they say, oh, we, they're, they're just a few of them. What they didn't realize was how entrenched the band of battle were in AI. They're letting you know you can't go always by what you see. But that wasn't even the cause of their defeat. Let's read on. So about verse 4, so about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of AI. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gates as far as Shabaram and struck them down on the descent. So the hearts of the people melted and became like water. They were demoralized. They were shook. They were filled with unbelief. They couldn't believe this was happening to them. Y'all know how we say, God, why am I going through all of this? Verse 6 says, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua was stunned, and he probably was asking, how could this be? A lot of times we say things, people of God, only because we have a limited amount of information in which to speak to or speak from. What Joshua didn't know at this time was what Achan had done. Let's read on. Verse 7. 8 and 9. Joshua asks God three questions in these next couple of verses. He says, O Lord, God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. Sounded just like their, their parents when Moses brought them out of Egypt, when they complained and mumbled and grumbled about you could have left us in Egypt. 
Another generation, same complaint. 21st century, same complaint. Oh, y'all just wanted to read the story of Joshua. No, we got to see us in the scripture. That's the beauty of what God has done for us. Hallelujah. The second question he asked in verse 8, Oh, Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies? We've been defeated, God. Now, here's where humanity really kicks in. He says, For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they will surround us and cut us, cut us and cut off our name from the earth. Y'all know what they're saying? Well, God, how are you going to do this? I've been professing you all these times, all these years. And now this happened in my life. What will people say? How do you think I'm going to look now when I go in amongst these church people and they done heard about the defeat in my life? How I couldn't keep... Okay, okay, Lord Jesus. The third question, still in verse 9. And what will you do for your name, for your great name? In other words, God, what about your reputation? You see how easy it was for Joshua to put everything on God? So the Lord said to Joshua, okay, I done heard what you had to say. Now, listen at this. Let me tell you what you don't know. Rise up. Why is it that you have been, have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Let's get to the bottom of this. Israel sinned. And in this next, and in this verse, he's going to give us the charge and the indictment against the nation, not the person against the nation. Israel has sinned. They have also transgressed my covenant. which I commanded them. And they have even taken some of the things under the ban. And they have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Let's use some of today's vernacular. They trespassed. They were stealing. Lying and concealing stolen goods. What was amazing about this, people of God, is even though Achan is the only person mentioned, Achan couldn't have carried all those goods by himself. All his family were guilty of aiding and abetting. Then they want to call Brother Juan and tell him I make bail for us. <laughs> no, they violated the covenant. Had one person, Deacon Hopper, had one person in the family spoke up, it could have saved the whole family. God says, this is the indictment against them. Verse 12, therefore the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. You will never have victory in your life as long as you have transgressed your covenant relationship with God. Amen. 
And when you think about all the things under the ban, the thou shalt not in Exodus chapter 20, then you get around verse 19 of chapter 20 of Exodus, and it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor, wife, possession, donkey, so forth and so on. When you begin to lust and have a strong desire for something that God has blessed someone else with, if you get on your knees, if you allow him to purify your hearts, he would do the very same thing for you. If you put your trust in him and stop leaning to your own understanding, God would allow you to be blessed just as much as the person who you are coveting, therefore you're coveting their blessings. You don't know what they have gone through. You don't know the sacrifice they have made. You don't know the nights that they stayed up calling out the name of the Lord. You don't know the time of fasting that they have placed before the throne of God. The sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Now, that really had to change everything for Joshua, because in verse 27 of chapter 6, the word of God says, so the Lord was with Joshua. And his fame was in the land, in all the land. But God tell him now, because of the violation, I can't be with you until you deal with it. Many of us sitting in here right now this morning, we want God to bless us indeed. Enlarge our territory. God said, I can't do that. There's some things that you have not made right. There's some things you have not taken out of your midst, mainly out of your heart. Nobody else may not know or see it, but I, the Lord, I see. I search the heart. Right. Huh. Verse 13. Rise up. Consecrate the people. Here's the remedy. Or the purge that's going to be necessary. Consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, there are things under the ban in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. God isn't moved by our tears. He's moved by our hearts of obedience. That same brother that you refuse to go and apologize to, God said, okay, you won't move, I ain't going to move either. Verse 14, in the morning, then you shall come near by tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come near by household. And the household which the Lord takes shall come near man by man. It shall be that the one who is taken with the things under the ban shall be burned with fire. He and all that belongs to him. You're talking about a nation of people. And when you see the process that God chose to utilize to get to one man, you would think at some point Achan would have repented and confessed. Maybe God would have relented then. But he's going about like, I don't know what they're talking about. I'm clueless. I don't have a clue. Who did it? Lord, is it I? Not only did he say that they shall be burned, not only are the things that were on the band shall be burned, but everything 
that belongs to him. He tells us why. Because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And the second reason is he has committed a disgraceful thing in Israel. And the church said, amen. Verse 16. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near by tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the family of Judah near and he took the family of the Zerahites and he brought the family of the Zerahites near man by man and Zabdi was taken. He brought his household near man by man and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah from the tribe of Judah was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, I implore you, I pray, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, In these next few verses, I want you to pay attention to one word. I. I. Because as kids, we were taught very well how to remove ourselves from situations, especially when mama got ready to whoop us. That was, that was, that was a long time ago. They don't whoop kids no more. They put them in time out. I didn't never find the scripture, Deacon Johnson, that said when you put them in time out, it'll bring about a correction. I did read Spare the Rod. Yes, sir. This word I. Truly I have sinned. What a confession. If we can just start there. Truly I have sinned. I missed the mark. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. I coveted, I took pleasure, I lusted after it. I had an intense desire for the things that I saw. And when you see the weight of the silver and gold, he couldn't have carried it by himself. Stop making excuses for those family members that we know have done wrong and we are covering for them. It affects the whole family. Mm, Y'all didn't like that one too much, did you? Y'all liked it better when we was talking about Aiken and his family. Aiken said, I saw it, I covered it, and I took. He wasn't the first one to follow this pattern, though. Eve did it in the garden. David did it when he seen Bathsheba. Some of us are doing it right now. Just keep looking over my head. You ain't got to, it's all right.
Verse 22. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath, just like he said. They took them from the inside, from inside the tent, and brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel. And they poured them out before the Lord. All of this took place because the covenant was transgressed. It's easy for us today, people of God, to miss the mark that God has established and to go about life as if we've done nothing. It's even a greater victory in our lives when we can take on what Achan said and confess, God, I've sinned. Not only did I sin, God, but I concealed that sin in my heart. Because I don't have to worry about nobody seeing it where I hid it at. The psalmist says, God, your word I have hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. So for me to have sin hidden in my heart means I can't have the word and sin in the same place. They can't cohabitate together. The word of God says he concealed it And they brought it to Joshua and the sons of Israel and poured them out before the Lord. Fast forward. The Lord turned the fierceness of his anger away from them as a result of what they did. And in chapter 8, you'll see that they did get the victory over Ai. But bigger than Ai, bigger than Jericho, the question is, what have we concealed in our hearts? We want God to bless us. We want God to heal us. We want God to prosper us. We want God to be for three and four generations. We want everything that God has promised to come to pass in our lives but yet we're not seeing how all of that is working together just yet. Can it be that while we have acknowledged to God, I I sinned, I did some things wrong. I even concealed some things, oh God, in my heart but I don't want to go another day like I am now. It's only one step left, people of God. Do as Achan did. They brought everything that was concealed and they poured it out before the Lord. It was not an easy thing to do. Especially in front of a nation of people. Even a setting like this, it's hard to say, God, I blew it. And all you want from me, God, is to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. But yet I still hold on to that which you told me to release. Whoever, wherever you are this morning, like God, I don't want this anymore. And if you're telling me all I need to do is just pour it out, that you can strengthen me, 
you will revive me. You will restore me. You will allow me to walk in right relationship with you all over again. I just need to pour it out. Where's that person? Where's that one person? Amen. 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 I hear in my spirit, Ella Chavez, I need the old, I need the Every hour I need thee, oh bless me now, my Savior, I Now, I, I really need this to be a confession and a declaration, not just the singing of words. And I want to challenge those individuals who slip their hands in the air. I promise you, if you slip them up one more time, I'll come get you. And we'll come together so that God can do what only he desires in your life, so that he can continue to bless you, he can continue to prosper you, and cause you to walk with your head lifted high in amongst all people. Where are those individuals that lift their hand? Lift their hand. Amen. Amen. I need. Keep them up so I know who I'm getting. Come and walk with me, brother. Praise God. Praise God. Meet me at the altar, brother. I'm coming with you. Go with him, my sister. God bless you. Amen. Join my brother. Anybody else over here? Mother, come on. Amen. God loves you. Come on with me. Come on with me. Amen. Amen. Go up to the altar there. Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Here, let me get your sweater, dear. Anyone else? Anyone else? Hallelujah. That's you. This brother right here is going to come with you. God bless you, brother. The victory that Israel needed came as a result of Achan confessing his sins to the Lord. Even though it cost him his life, God honored his word. And from that day on, Israel never lost another battle. Not another battle. Father God, in the name of Jesus, those of you that are standing, extend your hands towards these servants of God. Yeah, yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are at your altar, at your footstool, because we are not ashamed to acknowledge, God, that we need you. We are not ashamed, oh God, to acknowledge that, God, we believe in you. We have our utmost trust and confidence in you, but there are certain things, God, we did that was so not in accordance with our covenant relationship with, we have with you. And for this, oh God, we are laying those things on your altar this morning. 
we are casting every care, every concern, everything that is not of you that would not have brought a blessing to the people of God. We leave it here at this altar now. There is, according to the word, there is no condemnation on any of you now in the name of Jesus because you are in Christ Jesus. I pray even the more that as you open your heart and you give God your heart that he will come in and comfort you by his Holy Spirit. He will give you newness of life. He will bring about times of refreshing into your life like never before in the name of Jesus. Because you have put your trust in the Lord, he shall not put you to shame. He shall not turn his ear away from you. Call unto him and he will answer you and show you great things that you do not know. In the mighty name of Jesus, we celebrate these people now. We celebrate them now in the name of Jesus. We celebrate them for their boldness. We celebrate them for their love and their desire for God and the God alone. In the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We rejoice now. In Jesus' name, I say yes, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, yes, I will search you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole Brothers and sisters, as you turn to return to your seat, know that it's not just the place that you're returning to, but you're returning in victory over whatever it was that you was holding on to and you have given it unto the Lord. Don't pick it up again. Walk in victory. Walk in the favor of God, knowing that he is with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen. And my answer will be yes.
Hallelujah. <clears throat> Father, we love you and we give you thanks. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. God, I thank you for these, your people. I thank you even the more for those that walk amongst us and made an open declaration that they wanted to pour everything to you, God. I thank you, O oh God, because your word declares, we who the Son has set free is free indeed. I thank you for the spirit of liberation that you have allowed to blow across this sanctuary this morning. And may we all, from the least to the greatest, walk in the favor, the victory, and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, today and forevermore. And the church of God said, amen, amen. amen. As you take your seats briefly, we want to <clears throat> honor the Lord in our giving, in our tithes and offerings. And while you are preparing your tithes and offerings to be returned to the Lord, I want you to remind you that registration is still going on in the Narthex for the Marriage Enrichment Fellowship. We are almost at our numbers, but we do have room for a couple of more. Uh, so do take the opportunity to stop by the table. And also the Women of Life will be there beginning their registration as well. So let's connect with all the worship and the ministry opportunities that are being made available to us here at the Life Center Church. Also, if there's anyone that is here this morning that's a first time visitor, if this is your first time visiting with us this morning, just slip your hands in the air right where you are. Any first time visitors? First time, first time. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. We have some of our servants that are giving you a brochure, welcoming you to the Life Center Church, and we pray that this will not be your last time, but we thank God for you being here with us this morning. Amen. Glory to God. People of God, obey God. When we say we obey God, we're simply saying, God, I submit and I comply with the authority that you have over and in my life, in and over my life. Amen. And if you don't know what his authority is, just spend a few minutes in this word. Just read it and he will make things ever so plain for us all. Amen. Glory to God. With everyone having an opportunity to give unto the Lord, let us stand that we may receive the benediction and walk in the blessings and the favor of God each and every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And the household of faith said amen. Amen. amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord.